Hi, my name is uh, Dave Mangs. I'd like to welcome you to our program of Rotary Making a Difference. Um, and today uh, we're going to explain a little about what Rotary is. And uh, no, it is, it is not a traffic circle in Massachusetts. Uh, Rotary provides service to others, promotes integrity, and advances world understanding, goodwill, and peace through a fellowship of business, professional, and community leaders. Um, our vision is that we are a service organization of choice with dynamic, action-oriented clubs whose contributions improve lives worldwide. International Rotary is in 200 countries. We have 1.2 million members. And my job uh, is to be the district governor uh, this year, 2017-2018, uh, of Rotary District 7890, which includes the four counties of western Massachusetts and the four northern counties of uh, Connecticut. And I'm very proud to be here to uh, explain a little about what Rotary is doing in the world uh, to make the world a better place. And, and today, I'm so very pleased that we have a very special guest, uh, Shirley Pat Chamberlain. She came in uh, for our Rotary annual foundation dinner and has graciously agreed to appear on our uh, program today. You know, Shirley, Shirley Pat is dubbed the original champion spark plug by, by his honor, Stephen L. Point, 28th Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. Shirley Pat Chamberlain uh, is an energetic, passionate literacy advocate with infectious good cheer who is committed to service above self in the pursuit of Aristotelian real good. Now, driven by an insatiable curiosity and passion for changing the world around her, Shirley Pat has been committed to social action literacy initiatives and community development innovation in rural and remote British Columbia in both indigenous and non-indigenous communities. Uh, Shirley Pat's first experience with Rotary was at the age of 15 through a four-way test competition. Now, in Rotary, we have certain mottos. One is uh, service above self. And we also try to say at every Rotary meeting, uh, the things we think, say, or do does first, is it the truth? Mm -hmm. Second, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendship? And fourth, is it beneficial to all concerned? And at 15, she decided to write an essay, which she happened to win on the four-way contest, and that was her first introduction to, uh, to Rotary. Um, you know, she has started something called Right to Read, and we're very concerned in Rotary about a number of areas, maternal and child health, um, and also literacy, um, international peace, and conflict resolution. Um, you know, we are working very hard um, on literacy because we see that as part of the, what we call the pyramid of peace. And uh, she has started a project called Right to Read uh, in the indigenous communities in uh, British Columbia and is an example of a young uh, Rotarian with passion that's truly trying to make a difference in the world. Uh, she's had uh, some amazing honors, um, you know, including um, receiving the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Award, and I think you're wearing that yeah. right at the, at the moment. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome her from the University of Edinburgh, Center for Canadian Studies. Uh, Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh is one of the top universities uh, in the world, one of the top 20, and she's uh, writing her dissertation on exploring the role of civil society organizations in indigenous social citizenship in, in Canada. <laughs> That's a bit of a mouthful there, but uh, Shirley will, I'm sure, explain a little bit more. Um, Shirley, um, what brought you into Rotary, and why should other young uh, professionals consider Rotary uh, in their lives? 
Well, Dave, it's an honor to be here and an honor to be in Connecticut. Thank you for inviting me. Um, for me, my story of Rotary is a little bit different than most. My mother voluntold me. So my mom is a Rotarian, and it was part of uh, the ethics and values that I was taught as a child in our family to participate and do good in the world and to serve your community. So sometimes it's um, worthwhile to do things for others, is what I was taught. And my mom included me in Rotary events, and I realized that despite maybe a difference in age, um, in many cases gender, uh, Rotar other Rotarians shared my values and ethics and service to others in order to do good in the world. I think one of the main reasons that um, individuals should join Rotary is we're really people of action. And it's where neighbors and friends and problem solvers share ideas in order to sort of create lasting change in the world today. And what I've discovered is that Rotarians are very open to mentoring um, younger members. And I think uh, for anybody who's of a certain age, to be called young at 40 is always a bonus <laughs> and a privilege and doesn't often happen in other places. But in Rotary, you are still considered a youngster, um, which is always good for the ego. Um, but it is a place where people are willing to share their experiential knowledge and mentor you, but also provide you the opportunity to try, to take the lead, to act, and to explore ideas. And really, it's easier to do more good together than alone. And without Rotary, I would probably still be trying to figure out how to bring books, let alone building library literacy centers, with my good friend, past district Bob Blacker, and his honor, Stephen Point, across British Columbia. You know, we were so impressed with your passion, and I, I think it's fair to say that Ro Rotarians pursue their passion and find in Rotary a fellowship of men and women who help them achieve those goals. Was that, was that your experience in British Columbia? It, very much my experience in BC. When I first joined Rotary, I think I was a little put off by the kind of frozen image that is Rotary and how we've been portrayed previously as an old white boys club and what I affectionately call male pale and stale. <laughs> However, when I joined Rotary and truly became a Rotarian and started to participate in things outside of my club and community in the larger Rotary world at the district level and at Rotary International level, what I discovered was a multi-generational group of individuals of diversity that were willing to support me, mentor me, and provide me with ideas, connections, and resources, in particular through our Rotary Foundation, that allowed myself and the Right to Read team to create a project that is sustainable and creating life-changing impacts within the now 15 communities that we've put library learning centers in. We have another 15 in the planning, and if it wasn't for the support of my fellow Rotarians, and partners of Rotary who are just as important, stakeholders and the community members themselves, we would still, I think, be working on the first library. <laughs> you know, I, I'd, I'd like to go back to, the, to um, you know, the very beginning. Mm. You know, what was it, you know, there's always a passion. There's what I call a Rotary burn in the belly <laughs> that very often drives Rotarians to make uh, a difference mm. in, in their communities and in the global village. Mm. And there was something that happened in your life. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a picture of, of this young girl. What, yes. what was it that um, brought this up for you? So the picture you see on your screen is of his honor, Stephen L. Point, who was, like many Rotary stories, one of the sparks. Because what happens in Rotary is you have people or ideas that spark others. And part of the reason I'm called the original spark plug mm -hmm. is Right to Read members are typically the spark who have that passion that make it happen. And for me, as a literacy advocate, the spark was the little girl that you see in the picture. Her name is Tiara Solomon. And when I was uh, visiting the community of Teclesco, the Tusi Indian Band, I was asking the education coordinator, Shirley Gambush, and chief and council, and the members that I was meeting with what literacy resources they had available in their community and Shirley pointed to a shelf behind her and on it was a 1964 Encyclopedia Britannica set and it had six volumes missing and she said that's it that's all we have. You mean in the whole 
Indian community. Now, In was, the, it, was this a village or? So it's, a, it's one of the smallest of the six Chilcotin communities. Um, they have over 300 members and on reserve or in the community themselves, there's about 180 members. More than half of them are youth or kids. Um, typical to many of the communities we serve internationally, uh, because of the legacy of colonialism and forced assimilation in Canada, many of the reserve communities across the nation, including in British Columbia, have you know, higher than average health risks, higher than average youth suicide rates, higher than um, average unemployment rates, and to be honest, very low literacy rates. So when I went to visit them, having only these resources was really brought home when an elder said to me, well, you can't learn to read if there's no books. And as he was saying this, this little girl that you saw in the picture, Chera, tugged on my sleeve and said to me, I love to read. My favorite time of the month is when our youth coordinator takes us into Williams Lake to the public library. I said, oh really? She goes, yeah, I get to take out as many books as I like. And what you have to understand is um, I service an area in British Columbia that's roughly the size of Ireland. And so it's huge. And so the round trip for these kids on the bus to the public library is about 100 kilometers. So that's about 60 miles for our oh, American wow. friends. <laughs> and, um, what she expressed to me is that by the time she got back from the public library, she'd read all the books on the bus. Oh. So she didn't have anything new to read for the next two weeks. Mm. And she was very facetious, which I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> she was a spark plug. She I was think. a spark plug. And she said to me, hands on her hips, what I would like is I would like a library. And her mother cleared her voice and gave her that look that I'm sure we've all had from our own moms. And she looked up to me and went, please. <laughs> and for me, that was it. That was the really the spark for Right to Read. And it was that synergy that Rotary creates when you have these opportunity to connect with people that you may never have otherwise met. And that connection happened through Pacific District Bob Blackard, who also is the aide de camp for our Lieutenant Governor. And at that point, it was his honor, Stephen L. Point, who was our first Indigenous Lieutenant Governor. Oh my. And for Stephen, He's lived this experience. This was his own experience. He was one of the first Indigenous people in British Columbia to go to law school. He's now a judge. So for him, when he was gifted books, what he said is in a book you could be anybody. You could dream to be anything, anywhere, anytime. And he wanted to bring the gift of literacy and create literacy equity. And when you're the Lieutenant Governor, you get to pick a project and a passion. And it just so happened that our passions aligned and there was a spark. And together, he just, I, I still am not quite sure why, but he <laughs> gave me the opportunity to help him make his dream a reality. And that's how it started. Now, it, 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 there's always a chicken and an egg <laughs> phenomenon. You know, when, when, Rotary, uh, when Rotarians get a passion in their belly, yeah. and they, they work with other Rotarians who, who are optimistic yeah. and believe that they can change the world for the better. Um, we, we don't attract pessimists, is what I've found. Uh, but we do attract dreamers, people that turn dreams into goals and goals into reality. How in the world did you get started with 15 libraries, <laughs> 15 on the drawing boards? And what was the beginning? Sometimes it, it is a spark. It's a small amount of money that grows into an enormous uh, effort on behalf of, of a need, in this case literacy, yeah. for uh, indigenous people who are marginalized in our society. How, how did, what began this whole process? So it was really in typical fashion to start small. <laughs> our goal was to bring books to these rural and remote communities and the idea was to put in little corner bookshelf libraries in existing spaces and places. The other challenge with marginalized communities, not only locally, but those we service internationally, is infrastructure. And there isn't always space in place. So the idea was to utilize existing space. Build a couple bookshelves, throw some books in, bada bing, bada boom, you have an instant library. So <laughs> you share your Rotary story with other Rotarians, and as you say, somebody else sparks something. And it happened at a district assembly where I was sharing with Rotarians, and this fellow said, hmm, came up to me after and he said, so you're putting in libraries? I said, yeah, little bookshelf libraries in a corner. He goes, well, my name is David Taft and I own Brickco Mobile Buildings. I said, okay. He said, we provided the 12 um, 
mobile units for the Vancouver Olympic Games for all the media. Oh. They're sitting in my yard. How would you like a library? <laughs> I said, well, what would be the cost, sir? And he said, well, as a Rotarian, the first one will be free 99 just the price I love. <laughs> so we turned... That's 399 Free 99 Oh, free. <laughs> free. Free 99, 99. Oh, yeah. that's The rotary good. price, <laughs> as yes. I like to call it. This is what happens in rotary. It People does. step forward and it just happens. It just happens. And I also happen to have what was uh, in British Columbia is referred to as a gaming grant through my local rotary club, the Rotary Club of Williams Lake Daybreak. So we partnered with David Toff's club, Langley Central, and together we wrote a district grant. And my Rotary, uh, then now past district governor, Penny Offer, approved the grant and then gave us what's known as sort of the leftover money when you don't sort of allocate, as you know, as a district governor, all yes. of your funds for the year. Yes. So we ended up turning $3,000 into about 10000 with the district grant. That, mm -hmm. in turn, turned this project from a few thousand dollars to put a library in a corner into a, almost a $75,000 project. 75000 <laughs> Yeah, and literally I only had about $9,000 cash. Oh my. And so the rest of it is in kind or donations or human capital. Yes. You know, what uh, everyone should know is we have a Rotary Foundation which has uh, just about a billion dollars right now. Mm -hmm. And it has, uh, a, it's, it's, it's a way that we're able to support community projects mm -hmm. and global initiatives around mm -hmm. the world. And obviously here's an example where our Rotary Foundation has, has made a difference mm -hmm. in your community. Now, so we've got our, that's our first library, yes. right? And okay. then the second library was also in my region. Because if you're going to do it once, you might as well do it twice. <laughs> so we then the following year uh, with my sister club, the Rotary Club of Williams Lake, and we partnered with clubs in Commerce City, Colorado. So we actually truly turned it into an international project. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we put in the UNICE Teen Library Learning Center. It sparked Rotarians across my district and the two sister districts in British Columbia, and Bob started to recruit other Rotarians to do Right to Read in their own area. I then, because I, you know, I have a little bit of energy, I don't know if you've noticed, I don't <laughs> tend to sit still very long, and for me, literacy is not just about reading and writing. Literacy is that thread that weaves together all of the other social determinants of health in a community. And so we had an opportunity to then partner with UBC, and the University of British Columbia's dental school. Oh. As one of another Rotarian, uh, Doug Nielsen, is um, and has started the International Dental Mission, where he brought UBC students, dental students and hygienists, around the world to do free dental missions. Bob and I thought, hmm, we could do this in our own backyard. <laughs> and so we, he started on the coast, and I brought it to my region. And since 2014, we've run a dental mission partnering uh, Clentin Co, another Chilcotin community, with the UBC Dental School and provide approximately $18,000 of free dental service in two and a half days every July. My goodness. We're now working on the third library because, again, <laughs> PhD is not that much work. No, just kidding. It is a lot of work, but I still need to pursue my passion in order to have work-life balance. So. Um, what we were able to do now is we've partnered with Honey Quatine, the most rural and remote of our communities in the region, and we are going to build a purpose-built, community-designed library. And the reason for this is David Taff has sold Britco, and unfortunately the company was partialed out, and our amazing relationship with them has come to an end. And we're very grateful because without them, we wouldn't have been able to do the first 12 libraries. So now, moving forward, we have a Right to Read BC team, which includes architects, engineers, construction experts, literacy professionals, librarians, um, people who will help us build and install. And we're also writing grants so that these professionals mentor and share their skills with community members. This is an incredible <laughs> rotary story, and it all started because of that little girl. Because of that little girl, because Miss Tierra, if she hadn't put her hands on her hip and demanded <laughs> very facetiously and very cutely for a library, I'm not sure if we would have thought or dreamed as big. And it also, the spark of other Rotarians who were willing to give not only their time, but their resources and expertise. So like Rotary International projects, what we've been able to do is partner urban clubs with more resources and access to 
some things that maybe those of us in more rural areas don't have with smaller rural clubs and indigenous communities. And that synergy has brought people together to really change the conversation, change the relationships, change the story, and I really think we're going to change the future. Well, that's a wonderful story, Shirley Pat. I, you know, as I, I look at what the future will, will bring, you know, we have something called global grants. Yes. And uh, this is where you have to partner, you know, and apply to Rotary Foundation mm -hmm. with a Rotary Club in, in a, a foreign country. Um, you know, we're certainly hoping that uh, in New England, we've got uh, eight, eight, eight districts throughout New England that are part of the Northeast Pets uh, Collaborative, and we've found a great deal of interest among my fellow <laughs> district governors yes. in partnering uh, with, with your project. Uh, we also have a concern for Indian reservations here in America, such as in the Dakotas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I see, you know, a, a, an opportunity here for replicating this right to read mm -hmm. uh, program in our country and in Canada mm -hmm. and expanding uh, what's working uh, in to, to the indigenous communities. Well, you know? interesting that you say that because Right to Read BC is now also Right to Read Ontario. And oh. we've expanded into Ontario. And as a result of your invitation to, and your fellow district governors of last year to Northeastern President elect training and the humbling and awe-inspiring cash donation of almost eleven thousand dollars i've literally never had money thrown at me like that yes. it's pretty amazing yeah. we should we should say um you know a mark brady our district governor nominee and you can stood see up in the picture behind us <laughs> yes stood up and um, said i'm throwing in twenty dollars let's see what we can do each of the eight districts and you know each one has about 60 rotary clubs and in my district we're 59 rotary clubs and 2100 rotarians and so all eight districts contributed 1500 each plus a pile of cash it turned uh, out to be five thousand and eleven dollars <laughs> that was thrown in front of me plus the matching that came in yeah. from the districts uh, what a what a wonderful gift to you now when we we do a, a a global grant we also get matching from our billion dollar rotary foundation it's true you know so yeah. we're we're looking forward to uh, doing a lot more and expanding this uh, wonderful right to to read uh, project uh, how uh, how do you? How do people join Rotary? Oh. Yeah, is one of the one of the uh, things I think we should. You know, a lot of times it's like this hidden secret. You know, <laughs> um, because it used to be you were only asked, and uh, and if you weren't asked, you never got in. Well, but aren't we making it a little easier for young professionals? people that are pre and post retirees and certainly women you know one third of my district is women I want to see it at at least half mm -hmm. we're we're also uh, starting interact and rotaract clubs which are many rotary clubs interact is 12 to 18 years of age mm -hmm. we have a, about 36 in our district at this time in high schools mostly uh, and then rotaract can be community based or mm -hmm. school based uh, we're in the process of starting a new rotaract clubs at uh, Yukon Smith College College, uh, Eastern Connecticut State, uh, Connecticut Central. We have some at Bay Path in Putnam. Uh, <laughs> you know, so you know, this is a, a movement where we're bringing the values of Rotary and the opportunity to serve others. You know, to the to the next generation. But what what, what ideas do you have on uh, membership? Mm. You know, how do how do people get involved in this wonderful organization? Well, I really truly believe that there will only be a Rotary tomorrow if we do things for Rotary today. And I'm very impressed with our current Rotary International Council, our president and our vice president, who have pushed and moved Rotary to sort of expand and change and move with the times. So as you say, we're no longer male, pale, and stale. We are an action-oriented group of individuals who are diverse and across, I think it's 35,000 clubs across many, almost all countries in the world. So now, you can join Rotary and put yourself forward. So what you do is you go to www.rotary.org and click on the menu and it says get involved. Click on that and what you do is you express your interest and you're matched with a local club in your area, Rotaract Club or Interact Club. And that gets the process started. Okay. So you can put yourself forward. You don't have to wait to be asked. And I would encourage all the Rotarians listening, don't wait. Ask someone to be a Rotarian because it's about time. 
You know, the, um, the other thing we're finding is that these Interact and Rotaract clubs are, are changing the Rotary world. Mm. You know, the, the reason we're starting so many in, the, in our district is young people coming out of Interact are, are looking at their college and saying, where's my Rotaract club, mm -hmm. you know? And so we're having to step up as Rotarians and give them what they're asking for, an opportunity to serve their community and the international global village. I agree. And I think it's for those of us that dare to dream, we're going to be the ones to change the world. And what I love about Interact and Rotaract clubs is you give them an idea and they're back to you like within a day and they've already figured out how to plan and solve. All the bureaucracy that sometimes happens in some of the more established clubs are no longer there. And these kids are amazing. Yes. And the young professionals are stepping up in such a big way. So I suggest that you check out our website, see if there's a club near you, and just come on out and see if you can get inspired and act to change the world. That's fantastic. And I'd, I'd very much uh, like to invite everyone to learn about Rotary, come visit one of us at a, at a Rotary meeting, approach other Rotarians. Uh, we're special people. We try to make a difference in our community. And uh, consider, consider membership and consider making a difference in, in your community and in the global village. I, I should say one final thing. One of the advantages, you know, we've been raising money for Harvey, Irma, and uh, oh, Maria, wonderful. and the, the, you know, the Mexican earthquake throughout the district. And when you give to Rotary, there's mm -hmm. no overhead. You're a volunteer last time I checked. I am, yes. <laughs> and, and I a, am too. And 100% of all the money that goes to the Rotary Foundation goes back out. And in the last 100 years, we've put $3 billion into projects in our own backyard, our own communities, and into the international world. And you can always find a Rotarian because we do like a little flair and a pin. <laughs> yes. And that's an easy way to identify us. <laughs> it is. You know, I'm, I'm wearing my, you know, just two pins today. Mm, but, mm. you know, sometimes if I'm at a Rotary meeting, I get carried away a little bit, I have to admit. <laughs> uh, but we, we have, a, have a good time and we make a, a major difference uh, in our world. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for our program, uh, Rotary Making a Difference. And um, I hope to see you in future programs uh, that will be uh, airing on this uh, show. Uh, in, and thank you for your involvement.